special day in the Lutheran tradition. This is a recreation of the 1526 Deutschmess, or the German worship service. This would have been the first step away from the, the Catholic Church's um, Mass in Latin, which had been celebrated for centuries, but nobody ever understood it. There's a lot of stories about the priests not even really understanding what they were saying. So Luther took a look at that and said, we need to do something different here. People are not being connected to God in worship. And so he wrote a, a worship service for people in their own language, which I'm sure at first was very awkward and very strange, but grew into the tradition that we know as the Lutheran liturgy. And so if what we do today seems old-fashioned, or if it seems strange, if it feels more Catholic to you than usual, then just remember, this is the first step away from that Catholic Mass. Not the most recent one, the first one. So it's going to feel older, it's going to feel a little bit, a little bit stranger, more old school to you, but that's kind of one of the points here. All of the songs and the prayers and exhortations and collects and all the things that we'll be using today are original, although translated into English. Um, I think appropriately. It's all original from that 1526 worship service. Our red hymnal, that's the ELW, this one that's in the uh, pockets right in front of you, contains all of the music that we need for today. Um, you could, if you want to, you could take a look at the bottom left of each page that we're singing for today and see. It was either written by Luther, it was written just before Luther and used by him, or it was written by his friend, Nicholas Decius, who was kind of the first Lutheran liturgist. Um, the big changes were that it was in the language that people could understand. Um, all the words were really sort of meant to emphasize God's grace and not works of our own or the works of the saints. Um, and again, if it seems strange to you, just imagine what it was like for those first worshipers in 1526 in Luther's church who were for the first time stepping into a whole new way of doing church, of doing worship, of doing liturgy together. Now, let me just make a special note today. When I talk about the Catholic Church, and I'll, I'll preach about this a little bit later, when I talk about the Catholic Church, we are not condemning or putting down our Catholic brothers and sisters and the way that they do worship. Remember that when Luther um, started the Reformation, there was only one church came in town. It was the church. It wasn't the Catholic Church or the Protestant. It was just the church. So Luther took a step away from that and said, this, this church entity has too much power, too much control, and they've gone astray on both things. So let's reform those things and do things in a different way and sort of be inclusive. Now, it didn't turn out that way. It turned out to be uh, division, and now there are thousands of different denominations in the world. But Luther just knew that one church. So if I talk about the Catholic Church, I'm just talking about the church of the day. I'm going to be talking you through our worship service today, so when you need to be on a certain page or when you're doing something, I'll make sure to make a note of that verbally so that you can... Um, follow along best we can. And I think that ought to do it. Okay. Thanks a lot to all of our help. I feel like half of our congregation is in the narthex right now. So we'll have a, a big processional today, which is part of uh, all the pageantry that goes along with our Reformation service. I appreciate your flexibility in trying something new and different. What? But remember, this gets back to the roots of not only of the Lutheran faith, but of all Protestantism, and so we, we look back so that we can fully appreciate the present and then look toward the future. Thanks be to God.
Dear God, in the name I wish to be baptized, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains shake in the depths of the
steadfast in your word, curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your Son and bring to naught all he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your holy church that we may sing your praise triumphantly. O comforter of priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. Amen. Please be seated.
grace is yours, and so is, so is peace from Jesus Christ who died for us, God the Father who created us, and the Spirit that guides us every day. Amen. <clears throat> Let me just make another quick note that this isn't how we usually do things. I see a few new faces out there, and just kind of sure. But you know, we are glad to be 21st century Christians. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing that we do, just to remember the tradition of the Reformation. I think that my new favorite Reformation Sunday tradition is going to be this annual reminder to you all, and you can take it as a threat, would be that, um, remember, that in the time of Luther, preaching usually lasted about 200 minutes. So 200 minutes. In fact, if you've been to Germany, places like Wittenberg or Air Force, maybe you've seen the great big um, uh, things that they would turn to show the preacher at the back of the church at the time. Each one of them um, was about 90 minutes. And so when, when both of those had expired, the preacher knew it was about time to wrap up. Remember, too, that this worship service that we're in today, this is a, a 10.30 worship. This would be like the midday mass. For those 16th century Christians, they would have had early morning Mass, midday Mass, and then evening Mass as the sun was setting. So you could plan to be in church for many hours through the day on the Lord's Day. Not such a bad thing, but I'd just like to remind you that for all those worship services, there was no seating for the congregation. And so you'd be standing through my 200-minute sermon, which I think just sounds amazing. I could really get through a lot of stuff up here in 200 minutes. And if you weren't paying attention, you really know it. Because you just pretty much have to fall out on the floor. There would be no, no other option. And then we could really make you feel bad afterwards. Those were the days, weren't they? <laughs> anyway, um, that's not what we're all about today. But it is a reminder for us that what we know today as our church comes from very distant roots in the, in the distant past. But it's something we can celebrate uh, back then continuing in the work that we do as the church today, and knowing that God blesses also in the future. But I'm thinking next year, maybe, we'll set up a four-hour worship, we'll take all these views out of here, uh, just to be authentic, just for the sake of being authentic. There are lots of fun things that we could do to enhance this worship service, but for now, let's just get to the message of the day. It's not 200 minutes long. Experts agree. Experts agree. You can go online, you can read psychology textbooks, you can listen to motivational speakers. Experts agree that one thing you can do to just lighten the load in your daily life is to let go of the things that you don't have any control over and to just take advantage of the things that you do have control over. Amen to that? I wonder if anybody's gone through the spiritual exercise of just giving away the things that you can't control. The people... The, the things, the government, all the things that you can't control in your life, and just, just giving that away for a little while, just, just giving it to God, and feeling your shoulders get lighter as you do that. It's totally amazing. There's science behind it, when you can turn off the parts of your brain that try to control others, and try to control situations, and worry about things happening far away that you don't have any control over. It just brings a lot more peace, and it brings a lot more energy, to the things that you can control. And so it's just good advice across the board to let go of the things you can't control and really do well on the things that you can control. Inspirational speaker Byron Katie sums it up really well. She says, there are only three kinds of business in this world, my business, your business, and God's business. When you think to yourself, hey, he or she needs to get a job, or I want you to be happy, or you need to be on time, or you better take care of yourself, that means I'm in your business. When I'm worried about earthquakes, floods, wars, or when I will die, then I'm in God's business. And if I'm in your business, or in God's business, the effect is separation from you, from God, and from myself. That's a good way to think about it. We spend a lot of time in other people's business, don't we? They need to do something different. I can't believe they're not here today. He or she really needs to clean up their act, etc., etc. It happens with friends of yours, it happens with family members, it happens with people you've never met. It happens all the time. Life is better, it turns out, when you take care of the things that you can control, that you can take care of. It lightens the load. Don't worry about what you can't control. It's just good practical advice for living in the real world. It lightens the load. It turns out that we walk around in our everyday lives carrying heavy burdens. 
heavy burdens that mostly are things that we can't do anything about. And so they just get heavier and heavier and heavier as we go along. If it seems a little odd <clears throat> to be talking about what you can control and what you can't control today on a Reformation Sunday, then maybe we need to talk about something that happened 501 years ago now and the reason behind the Reformation in the first place. We all know that Luther was a person of intense faith. We know through his, re uh, his writings, which are voluminous and fill up entire libraries, that he was a person of practical faith too. Very faithful. Very practical. He grew up and he was trained in a system. And we can call it the Catholic Church, but again, at the time, it was just the church. It was the only name in town. And it had developed all these systems of philosophy and thought, liturgy and practice that had shaped the lives of believers like Luther. <clears throat> Sometimes it was for the benefit of the believer. Sometimes it was for the benefit of the church. And a few times it was for the benefit of both. By the time Luther was studying and teaching advanced theology and scripture and church leadership in places like Erfurt and Wittenberg and Germany, Luther's intense and yet practical faith was nagging at him furiously. His conscience was right there and it told him something just isn't quite right here. Something just doesn't add up. In the years following 1510, Luther had this growing thought, and it was, you could almost tell through his writings that, that it was just growing inside of him. He had to kind of write around it for a while, but then he finally just dove into the heart of the matter. At some point along the way, he believed that the church had overstepped its bounds in preaching and teaching, and it started to tell people that individual believers could threaten or earn their own salvation. He heard preaching from those who were selling indulgences. He heard preaching from local priests that basically said the sins of believers are supposed to weigh heavily upon them. And the way to lighten that load is to do good works and pay money to the church, which sounds pretty appealing to have that message. Listen, I know that your sin is weighing heavily upon you today, but if you just pay your pastor more, or put more in the offering plate, that is your ticket to salvation. That is an easy way out. It's an easy way to, to lighten that load. It sure is. And over the centuries, we get the, the sense that the church had just sort of drawn that connection and said, well, we need the money, and people need the relief, so let's just put those two things together. The more good work you do and the more money you give, well, the closer you are to heaven. Luther finally, after the Spirit had nagged on him for years, finally, in October of 1517, on All Hallows' Eve, of all things, walked up to the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, and he nailed his 95 theses on the door. 95 explanations of why he didn't believe that that was true. In these 95 theses, or these, these arguments, Luther essentially said to the church, and these were addressed to the church, to the Pope, saying, you are claiming to be able to control things that God alone can control. You should not lead people astray by teaching that we're able to secure our own salvation. Christ alone can do that. Word alone teaches us about that. Faith alone leads us to that. From that point on, <clears throat> although he didn't really want to start the Reformation at that point. He was just trying to start a dialogue. It was not at all uncommon for uh, people like him to do something like that. But from that point on, Luther would live a life separated from a church that actually he deeply loved. And he would dedicate his life to preaching and teaching that Christ is the center of a faithful life and nothing and no one else is. There is no substitute for Christ. Not your good works, not the money you pay, although we're in stewardship season. None of those things is at the center of your salvation. Only Christ is. Did he teach, I wonder? Does that mean that he taught? You mean to tell me, Pastor, that, that Luther taught us that Christ has won our salvation, so therefore we have nothing to do? What will Luther say? By no means. No. Rather, Christ freed us from the power of sin and death and freed us for a life of service and giving to the church. And as your Lutheran pastor, I hope that you trust my paraphrasing of Luther's much longer works. You can read them for yourself. I'll see you in about 
four years. But I hope that you trust me. And my, my paraphrasing of what Luther said, which is basically this, the Christian life is to be a life of focused dedication and piety. But always keeping in mind the things that you can control and the things that you cannot control. Piety and faith come <clears throat> from a, 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 certain, a certainty and a trust that Christ is victorious over sin today and every day. <clears throat> It's seen in the way that we are to trust Christ because he's the one who carries matters of life and death and eternity, heaven and hell and eternal salvation. He carries those things in his strong hands. And so the question from Luther, the question from Luther to believers throughout the life of the Reformation is this. Knowing these things, knowing that Christ shed his blood on the cross for you, what are you going to do about it? What is your reaction going to be? What does your life look like today as a person who's redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Christ has paid the penalty <laughs> for your sin, and so can you focus on the things that you can control and build God's kingdom here and now? If that sounds familiar, these aren't just Luther's words. He found that in the words of Jesus in the Gospels who didn't talk much about being saved and therefore going away somewhere else sometime later, but rather being saved and so doing something here and now to build God's kingdom right where you are. And so Luther's question remains today. Can we live a life of faithfulness here and now, even in the middle of such a confusing and sinful world? Matthew chapter 11, <clears throat> our gospel verses for today, that was one of Luther's favorite scripture passages. Come to you, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. Take my yoke upon you instead, and I will give you rest. It's such a gentle, pastoral kind of thing for Jesus to say. And Luther was so not like that a lot of the time. Luther got to be kind of gruff. Luther could be angry at times. He called people names at times. He could, but he always kept the core of that faith, and he returned to this uh, teaching in Matthew 11, time after time in his own life. Because Luther found through his own difficult life that he was carrying heavy burdens. And so time after time, he would have to go to Christ and say, I give it to you, O Lord, and I'm just going to do what I can do. Come to me, all of you are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. You will find rest for your souls. Luther believed that the church hierarchy had led people away from giving their heavy burdens to Christ, and instead kept them carrying on their own things that they could not carry. It led them to do things like pay, literally paying their way to eternal salvation. But that kept the burden right on themselves. How are we supposed to pay our bills and pay for heaven? That's a heavy burden. How am I supposed to do good things in this world and take care of my farm? That's a heavy burden. Where can I find time for salvation? This is the point where Luther would say, we've done people a disservice. That is in the hands of Christ alone. Christ is there. Luther's words echo all these centuries later. Christ is there, right there, with wounded hands outstretched, hoping, pleading with you even, that you will hand over your heavy burdens to Him. And remember, the burdens that we carry are mostly things we can't do anything about anyway. He's willing, ready and willing to take our heaviest burdens, to free our hearts and our minds and our hands to do the work of God in the places where it's needed right around us. The underlying theme of our gospel lesson today is this. We carry the heavy burdens which we can do nothing about far too often. Questions about the future, about people doing things far away from us, about life and death and salvation, questions about people far away, the burden of being owned by our own possessions. We carry all those heavy burdens with us here to church today and they weigh us down. Some of those things we can be proactive about. Some of those things we can do something about, and most of them we can't. Here comes Christ, and offers to take away those heavy burdens, to take what is only in His control, to take that back from us, 
and to place on us instead the yoke of his true salvation, the yoke of faith. It might not always be easy, but it welcomes Christ as a constant companion. And so I think the gospel message today for us is focus on the things you can control and let God do the things that God is willing to do. I don't know about you, but I feel a lot of heavy burdens today. Heavy burdens. And it weighs me down. I <clears throat> learned yesterday about much, another shooting. Another shooting in Pittsburgh. This time it was focused on a Jewish synagogue there in Pittsburgh. Eleven people dead and others wounded. That's a heavy burden. A heavy burden to bear. It's one of many such incidents in our country lately. I feel the burden of political rhetoric back and forth, back and forth. Not all politicians are the same, but we can feel that burden with us. What are we supposed to do? Are people really representing our values? How do we find the right person? I can't read through all that. I don't know what to do. Heavy burdens. The culture that we live in, being owned by our possessions, so many things weigh us down, and there's Christ. Wounded hands out, saying, give me that heavy burden. I will take it for you. And I will place upon you the yoke of faith and salvation. We're reminded too often that only God knows certain things, and some things are just in God's hands. And so I wonder, what heavy burdens are weighing you down today? Give them to Christ. Give them over to Christ's wounded and strong hands and walk tall and proud and the free person that God has made you to be. This is how we'll find rest for our souls. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's a little different than what we usually do. The peace of Christ be with you always. Share that peace together.
hear the exhortation the Eucharist, which is like a preface and thanksgiving at the table, which we do every Sunday morning. The bread will be consecrated into the body of Christ, and we'll sing together the Sanctus, which is hymn number 868 in your hymnals. Then I'll consecrate the wine into the blood of Christ, and we'll sing together the Agnus Stay. Remember, we sing the Holy, 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 and the Lamb of God uh, in all of our worship services. So we'll sing the Agnus Stay, hymn number 357, after which you'll be invited to come up for communion at the altar, like we normally do, as the ushers dismiss you. And now the exhortation. Dear friends in Christ, we are here gathered together in the name of the Lord to receive his holy testament. And I exhort you first to lift your hearts to God and to say with me the Our Father, according as Christ our Lord has taught us, faithfully promising that we shall be heard. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Next, I exhort you to Christ, that with right faith you take heed to the testament of Christ, and especially that you hold fast in your hearts the word whereby Christ gives us his body and blood and remission of sins, that you bethink you of, and thank him for the infinite love which he has shown us, in that through his blood he has redeemed us from God's wrath, from sin, death, and hell. And then to take to yourselves outwardly the bread and wine, which is his body and blood, for an assurance and pledge thereof. In such wise will we, in his name, and as he commanded in his own word, handle and use his testimony. Take you and eat of this. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. In remembrance of his holiness, let us sing together Luther Sanctus, found as in 868 in your red windows. Therefore, in 
remembrance that Christ is the Lamb of God, let us sing together the On You Stay, found as hymn 357 in the ELW. The rhythm.
Please stand as you read. O Lord our God, make us watchful and keep us faithful as we await the coming of your Son, our Lord, that when he shall appear, he may not find us sleeping in sin, but active in his service and joyful in his praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us his peace. Amen. Please stand in as you're able. Please continue standing as you're able and turn to our recessional hymn 517. Serve the Lord. Who would have done that? But go in peace, serve the Lord. 